Welcome back to the Packet Lab. Today we're going to take a look at Telnet versus SSH and why you should use one versus the other in your network. Before we get started here, what I want to do is tell you what this video is not going to be about. This is not going to be a video that steps you through setting up Telnet access to your devices or SSH access for that matter. There is another set of videos for both of those features. What we're going to be looking at today is specifically a comparison of these two features, Telnet versus SSH, and why you would prefer for one over the other. Most of this is going to be done in GNS3 and we will be utilizing Wireshark for reasons that will become apparent shortly. All right, let's take a look at Telnet. If you've worked on Cisco equipment, you've most likely used Telnet, unless you're a gooey cowboy, which, you know, is understandable if you're working on ASAs and some other stuff like that. But I'm willing to bet that almost all of you have used Telnet at one time or the other to connect to a Cisco device. Telnet was developed in 1969, so it was the uh, summer of love and the summer of Telnet. And it beginning with RFC 15. I think that's the lowest RFC number I've ever come across. That's insane. So Telnet is over 40 years old at this point. That qualifies it as a living fossil in the networking world. So Telnet uses TCP port 23. You're going to want to know that for the real world as well as for any Cisco examinations. Examinations exams. I suppose examinations is the full version of that. It just sounds all medical and creepy. Anywho, <laughs> Telnet predates TCP IP. That's how old this is. It was around before TCP IP was implemented and it originally ran over something called network control program protocols. No clue what that is. Uh, that's all trivia. You don't need to worry about that. Just to hammer home the fact that this is an old protocol. And here's the crux of what the video is going to focus on. Telnet by default does not encrypt any data sent over the connection, including passwords. And we're going to take a look at that on the CLI and especially with the packet analyzer called Wireshark and see where the problem with that is. The second of the protocols that we're going to look at today is Secure Shell or SSH. And you could tell by the name what the focus of this feature is going to be. Secure Shell or SSH is a network protocol that allows data to be exchanged using a secure channel between two network devices. It uses public key cryptography to authenticate the remote computer and allow the remote computer to authenticate blah blah blah. Unlike Telnet, SSH uses TCP port 22. And there are two versions of SSH, SSH1 and SSH2, and you can guess which one of those is the older version. Cisco routers running relatively newer code. I don't think 12.3 is considered newer code anymore. Well, it is newer compared to older semantics, yo. Um, support SSH2 in the old, earlier code supports only SSH1. And this last bit that's in italics is directly from the Cisco documentation. You can read through it. The important part is in bold. It says SSH allows a strong encryption to be used with the Cisco IOS software authentication. One quick side note, I'm not going to get into the theory of SSH. I, like I said, that's in a different video. But you'll hear sometimes SSH server. The router is the server. The terminal emulator is going to be the client. Sometimes you'll hear, oh, enable secure shell server on your router. That's just enabling SSH. Okay, so the big problem with Telnet has already been hinted at. It's that Telnet sends all traffic in plain text. That means if somebody's able to intercept your traffic stream, they're going to be able to read all your communications, and especially they're going to see your username password. So if you log into a Cisco device and you issue a username password, and it's via Telnet, that's being sent in plain text. If somebody's able to intercept that traffic, all they have to do is take a look at the packets, and they can get your username password. And we'll take a look at that on the CLI. Well really in Wireshark in just a few seconds here. Uh, SSH, on the other hand, encrypts all communications. If that same hacker intercepts that communication stream, he's going to see encrypted information. So it's, and Cisco says this is strong encryption. So he's got to go ahead and decrypt all that. So he's got a whole lot more work ahead of him because he has to decrypt these, this communication to get at your username password. Cisco recommends SSH be used instead of Telnet. And that's pretty much a no duh. And we'll see in the next slide, there's only a few and they're pretty much trivial by now, reasons why you would or could not implement Secure Shell. So here are some of the possible Secure Shell issues and they're becoming less and less relevant. I don't even know if these any of these are more than trivial anymore. First off, some older equipment does not support SSH and Cisco 2500 routers come to mind. 
I worked for a company that had pretty much nothing but 2500 routers and 2600 routers in their network. So one of the main drivers for finally fucking upgrading these routers from 2500s was that, that the routers would support SSH. Quick aside here, there are ways that you can encrypt traffic with Telnet or make it so that you're not sending the password itself. This particular company implemented something called one-time password. Ew, what a horrible pain in the ass that was. So you didn't actually send your password, you sent a code that was only valid for one time. Ergo, one-time password. But it was a pain in the ass because you had to have tokens and software to generate this and trust me, it's, it's nothing. It's, SSH is so much better. So get rid of your fucking old 2500s throw them in the lab, that's what they're good for now. And the second bullet point is that some terminal emulator applications do not support SSH. I don't know if that's even true anymore. I know that some of them didn't initially support SSH, but you could get extensions to do that. The ones that I use, uh, which are Secure CRT, TerraTerm Pro, uh, Once in a Great While, Putty, all support SSH, so I don't think that this is the case any longer and realistically with free options out there just change your damn terminal emulation application and the final one because the router must encrypt decrypt SSH communications it will use more CPU cycles this is true but it's pretty much trivial it's not gonna bog down your router if you're using a modern Cisco router platform like the 2800s you're not gonna have a problem with that so this video is not meant to get into configuring SSH and all the features of it. Suffice it to say, go ahead and use SSH on your network. And we're going to jump into the lab portion right now and take a look at the the big security hole with Telnet. So this is topology we're going to be using for this lab. It really doesn't even need to have three routers, I don't believe. We're going to be doing most of the configuration R1 and accessing R1 from R2 and possibly R3. Okay, and so this is already configured for Telnet access. Uh, basically, all I've done is allowed login local and I have a local username of Packet Lab with a password of Packet Lab. I also have an enable password set, an enable secret, which is going to be top secret password all uppercase. So if you were to access this from R2, we'll walk through that real quick. Basically you would just tell net to 10.1.12.1 and you would spell it correctly. And use Packet Lab, Packet Lab, enable is going to be top secret. Jeez, this seemed like a good idea when I came up with this password. There, okay, I got it right. It's a lot of letters. <laughs> Anywho, so that's normal Telnet operation, and we're going to go ahead and do this again, but what we're going to do is we're going to capture packets. Okay, we're back in GNS3. This is one of the features that I absolutely adore about GNS3 and why I recommend it. If you go and click on a connection, in this case from R1 to R2, go ahead and right click that. You get an option for capture and what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to capture packets on that connection and analyze them in the packet capture application of your choice. Now there might be a multitude of packet capture applications out there. I strongly suggest that you use Wireshark. It's free, it's open source, it's been around for a while. It used to be called Ethereal or Ethereal, whichever pronunciation you choose. That's what we're going to use and that's what I suggest that you use. With GNS3, I'll do this real quick. You might have to set up one of your preferences. If you go to Edit Preferences and then Capture, and just point it to the application and then you can have a file set up for your captures. Not a whole lot of configuration that you need to do. Okay, so we're going to take a look at Telnet traffic source from R2 accessing R1. So we're going to go ahead and click on this link between R2 and R1. Right click it, go ahead and hit capture and it's going to ask you for a source. Really isn't that important in this case because you've only got two-way traffic, but let's go ahead and pick R2 S0 slash 0 with the encapsulation of HDLC because that's what we're using by default. We're not using PPP. Hit OK and we should see Wireshark come up here and there we go. 